Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carbon Removal Newsroom. Today, we're welcoming a thought leader in free market environmental policy, Todd Myers, the director of the Center for the Environment at the Washington Policy Center. His 2022 book, Think Time to Think Small, How Nimble Environmental Technologies Can Solve the Planet's Biggest Problems, sheds light on how compact, innovative technologies are giving individuals the power to safeguard endangered wildlife, cut back on CO2 emissions, and combat the issue of ocean plastics. So Todd, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's nice to chat with you. Yeah, I'm always happy to have another fellow Washingtonian on the podcast. And all, as always, I'm Radhika Mulgafkar, Head of Supply and Methodology here at Nori. So with Todd's extensive background in environmental policy and public re relations, he really offers a unique perspective on the interplay between the marketplace and environmental action. In CDR policy news last week, a landmark bill was passed in Washington state, making it the first state in the US whose capital budget included funding specifically allocated for carbon dioxide removal. The move is groundbreaking as it goes beyond just CO2 and supports technologies designed to actively remove a full spectrum of greenhouse gases, including methane and nitrous oxide from our atmosphere. The state will distribute these funds totaling $12 million as grants. Businesses, academic institutions, and nonprofit organizations can apply, leveraging this opportunity to further their research development and demonstrations projects focused on carbon and greenhouse gas removal. So today, Todd and I will talk about his work in environmental policy, its application to carbon removal, and some of the recent news from Washington State. And we'll jump off time at the Washington State budget. So Todd, I'm curious about uh, your re reaction to the state's decision to allocate capital budget funding specifically for carbon dioxide removal. So I uh, think uh, in a lot of ways, I think it's great that um, people are looking across the spectrum for ways to reduce CO2 emissions, not just reduce emissions, but actually, you know, store carbon, uh, remove it from the atmosphere and do that. I think the what my book was about is the incredible improvement in technology to address a lot of these um, environmental and climate problems. So I'm really pleased that there is a, a broad perspective. I, uh, having uh, done environmental policy in Washington State for more than two decades, I've, you know, worked at the Department of Natural Resources, um, I am a little bit skeptical about uh, the state's ability to do this. I'm more um, hopeful about companies like Amazon and Microsoft, um, who are also looking at carbon removal, about their um, ability to focus on effective ways um, to um, remove and store carbon. So one of the things that when I looked at the capital budget, um, for instance, there are no metrics for um, success for cost for you know uh, how long the the carbon is stored all those sorts of things um, and the discussion of it is more about um, jobs now I will say that Washington State is one of the best places in the country uh, to do geologic storage we have lots of basalt the work that nori is doing i think is excellent on agricultural um storage we we have a lot of agriculture and a lot of opportunity to do those things so i really i like the notion that we are looking taking a broader look at how to um, reduce co2 emissions and reduce atmospheric co2 um, I think, however, at the end of the day, the government approach is going to be less successful than some of the Washington business approaches like Microsoft and Amazon. So, yeah, given your expertise in free market environmental policy, what role do you see um, in the private sector businesses and startups when they apply for these funds or driving innovation in carbon and car greenhouse gas removal? I mean, you talked about some big ones like Microsoft and Amazon, but what about like the more startup focused new technologies that need to be developed in the CDR space. Yeah, I th you know, what I would hope is that um, government programs would help create the market, because I think that's what startups need is increased market um, and increased market opportunities. Um, you know, Microsoft and Amazon, as you point out, they're big companies, so they, they can do their own thing, but we need to democratize uh, the carbon market so lots of people can look to it as an alternative. Um, and unfortunately, I think in that area, Washington's doing a bad job because our cap and trade system really tightly limits the amount of um, carbon offsets and um, the ability to use 
um, carbon projects to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, so I think that's one area that can help. Government can also help in basic research so that companies like Microsoft and Amazon can then look at, okay, what works and what doesn't. I think that's really the fantastic balance that government and private sectors and a company uh, like Nori can do, um, can strike the balance that they can strike. Government doing a lot of the basic research, national labs, other things like that, looking at how we can effectively store carbon and allowing carbon markets to incentivize um, people to use that technology and turn it into something that's um, marketable and effective. Since the rules haven't yet been written for how this is going to be spent, do you think there's an opportunity to to influence that in any way by, you know, through the administrative state? I hope so. Um, uh, and we certainly will be encouraging um, the state to put some good metrics. Now, you know, um, as we've seen with carbon storage, it's not just cost. Um, one of the advantages of carbon storage, whether it's uh, especially agricultural um, or geologic, is the certainty. Um, you know, carbon projects like forestry, I mean, I worked in forestry, but I'm very skeptical of forestry offsets for a variety of reasons. So, uh, you know, it is hard to find, there is no perfect balance, right, of cost and certainty, but that is one of the advantages that carbon storage provides, is that certainty in a way that some other uh, carbon reduction projects. So I hope that those sort of standards are put in um to the uh, regulation or uh, uh, to the rules like i said the, the way that it was written in the capital budget um those standards weren't there um and the focus was you know developing an industry rather than um, effective co2 reduction but um there's still time yeah i find it interesting because both washington and california which has recently passed uh you know some legislation around greenhouse gas emission about uh, reductions and things emphasize a lot the job aspect um, of it and how important it is to create a homegrown industry so just from your experience within washington state do you think that was because that was needed to get bipartisan support or um are there other reasons that only the job part seems to be emphasized and the other benefits are are not as prevalent in the language well washington state is very heavily democrat controlled so there was no need uh, for for bipartisan support um i don't know i think that i think that one of the frustrations I have with climate policy is, is that there is a, a, a sense that to try to make it all things to all people. Um, and what I see is, is that in a variety of ways, those other claimed benefits undermine the carbon effectiveness and drive up the price of reducing CO2 emissions to try to, you know, achieve other benefits. Um, so as an environmental economist, that frustrates me, you know, Politicians have a different viewpoint. They they want to claim, you know, um, that it's uh, both a floor wax and a dessert topping at the same time by saying we can reduce CO two emissions and grow our economy and create jobs. I think that those. I think uh, it's 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 hard to do all of those things at the same time and be effective. Um, so we will see where the balance ends up. Um, with these projects and with, with these grant programs. My experience with similar grant programs in Washington State is that the programs have been very ineffective. That's interesting. I mean, I'm curious why you think they're ineffective. Are they improperly managed or do you think it's because of the way the, the metrics are written, combination of both, something else? I think it's a variety of things. I think one is, is that um, the projects are not politically chosen, that's the wrong way to say it, but that they are influenced by politics. So Washington State has actually had um, a program for a long time called the Clean Energy Fund that has funded projects like this. So for instance, uh, methane capture, which would uh, count, uh, I think, under this system, because as you mentioned, the new um, carbon storage is for all greenhouse gases, so it would count for methane, and so capturing methane um, and then um, reusing that I think might count under this. And we've had those programs, but the programs that have been funded actually 
Um, uh, like one of them actually stopped early because it was so expensive and yielding so little. A lot of these tech, look, I love innovation and I am all for finding new ways um, to reduce CO2 emissions. And that's why I say I think government plays a great role in basic um, research that can be used by companies like Nori and then, you know, purchased by companies like Microsoft and Amazon. Um, but I think too often what we see is, is that the government, um, they go for what sounds good rather than what works effectively. And the most dramatic example of that is not in the um, carbon storage area, but in biofuels. Um, Snohomish County, one of the counties in Washington State, actually built their own biofuel feedstock plant for $5 million um, and literally never produced a gallon of feedstock. Um, it's the most dramatic example, but those sorts of things are always in the back of my mind. I much more trust the work that you are doing um, and that others are doing um, to you know, follow the good technologies and make them effective. Um, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Washington is the first U.S. state to take a step like this. So do you think this is a shift in how other states might approach funding in support of climate technologies, especially related to greenhouse gas removal? Or do you think Washington's going to be a little bit of an outlier? Um, I think, yeah, I think it could um, influence others. And, and just let me be clear, I think there is a really nice aspect of this. Um, which is, is that we should be looking more broadly at ways to reduce CO2 emissions. We shouldn't just look at, you know, sort of reducing emissions, but we, you know, we should look at storage and things like that, because what we want is a broad portfolio um, of projects in terms of cost, in terms of certainty and reliability. Um, you know, carbon storage offers some things that um, just simply reducing CO2 emissions or, you know, renewable energy credits or things like that don't offer. And having that broad um, portfolio of options is a really good idea. So I'm glad that uh, the state has broadened its perspective and is looking at these areas. Um, and, and I do hope that others pay attention because I think it can be effective. Um, because there's going to come the point where, and, and I think the point is here to some extent, where some carbon storage projects are cheaper than alternative carbon reduction efforts. And the more that we can um, encourage people to you to take advantage of those opportunities, rather than what can be very expensive alternative regulatory approaches is a great thing. And let me just say, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm not just buttering you up uh, because I'm on your podcast, but I do think, I mean, the thing about Nori and other businesses is, is that they have to prove results. Um, if you, you know, promise a certain amount of CO2 reduction and you sell it the, and, the, and you don't get that, the companies, you know, are going to come after you. We don't see that in politics. We see political approaches on CO2 reduction falling short repeatedly and there is no accountability. And I think that that difference in the level of accountability between government programs and private programs is really critical to make sure that we have effective CO2 reduction programs. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because um, I wanna pivot a little bit about some of the challenges that we have as startups, which is, you know, um, we have, local opposition and environmental justice groups who don't always like the projects that we're proposing. And I know Washington has a long history of advocacy and very strong uh, tribal nations. So as the free market and the government is experimenting in this space, how do you think we should be considering those challenges? Well, the, the complaints I have seen about carbon storage from the environmental left are twofold. The first is a project by project basis. As I mentioned, Washington State probably has the best um, opportunity for geologic storage because we have so much basalt and there have been efforts to uh, do experiments with those, um, including Pacific Northwest National Labs to see if it works and how, you know, whether they can get the science right. Um, and one of the key opponents were um, environmental groups. Um, they even were saying things like, we don't want to store pollution in the ground. <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, the, the language of CO2 as a, as a pollutant sort of come back, comes back to bite some folks when 
storing CO2 in the ground becomes uh, translated into storing pollution in the ground, which I think is sort of disingenuous. But the second thing is, is that I think that there is a um, sort of more philosophical opposition, which I uh, strongly disagree with, that says that if we can effectively remove atmospheric CO2 and store it um, using what other method? geologic, agricultural, whatever else, that it allows business as usual. And some groups don't want business as usual. That strikes me as not an argument about climate change. That strikes me as an argument about using climate change to force economic change. And I think that is really dangerous because if you make effective action on climate change contingent on sort of the economic battles and philosophies, we are likely to stall um, and, and not get very far. And the more political and the more partisan uh, we make these discussions, the less likely we are to succeed in meeting targets that people want to meet and doing and reducing CO2 um, in a cost effective and um, sustainable way. So I think that's I think both of those objections to carbon storage really frustrate me. One of them I think is simply NIMBY, um, and the other one I just think is, is really counterproductive to the overall effort of reducing the risk of climate change. So what would be your advice to the CDR community on how to kind of widen the public support or combat these narratives that you were just described? I think, um, you know, I come from the center right, um, although I'm very sympathetic, obviously, I hope you can tell, um, to um, efforts to reduce CO2 emissions. And the skepticism I get is from, you know, politically chosen, picking and choosing winners, as people say. But when I, you know, tell them, it's like, look, we need to have, let the markets choose, let innovation flourish and find ways to effectively and cost effectively, inexpensively reduce CO2 emissions, um, a lot of the nervousness goes away because when it is, you know, companies and markets choosing rather than politicians, um, I think people on the center right say, well, look, I may not agree. Um, I may think climate change is not as serious as other people, but look, if Amazon wants to spend its money that way, that's their issue. Um, and so creating markets, as I said, I think was a really powerful way for government to promote that innovation that is going to be critical um, if we're going to effectively reduce CO2 emissions. And creating markets also means that small innovators, of which there are many, um, can compete. If you have to have a good idea and a lobbyist, <laughs> you are less likely to succeed than if you just have to have a good idea and put it on the market. And that's, I think, uh, the way we're going to get where we need to go. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point. I was just on my talking to somebody else about some of the work that the UNFCCC is doing on carbon removal and how these our small companies have a hard time having a voice in a big organization, you know, in a big bureaucracy like the UN and how you do that while trying to develop an industry. And it's just very hard to your point, like if you need a lobbyist and to build a business at the same time. So. Yeah, you should look, you should be focusing on making the technology work and finding, you know, customers. Um, you shouldn't have to spend a lot of your time worrying about decisions in uh, New York or Brussels or anywhere else. Yeah, I <laughs> I agree. Um, so I wanted to now pivot to your book, Time to Think Small, and talk about it kind of in relationship to carbon removal. So obviously, your title kind of says it all. You advocate for small decentralized technologies to combat climate change and other environmental challenges. So how can you see these technologies fitting into the landscape of carbon dioxide removal strategies? These uh, you know, your decentralized technologies. Yeah, I think a lot of our mindset about, like I said, I've worked in environmental policy for 20 years, and I think a lot of our approach to environmental policies in general and climate change in particular is based on the success of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and, and similar laws in other uh, countries. When we had you know, air pollution problems, when we had water pollution problems in the United States, we passed, we created the Environmental Protection Agency and we passed laws that 
you know, uh, targeted point sources of pollution. And it worked. <laughs> we have much cleaner air and much cleaner water today than we did in the 1970s because of those things. And that success has um, influenced how we think about solving future problems like the ones we have now with climate change. But the world is very much changed. Not only the nature of the problem, we don't have just big, you know, we don't have big smokestacks uh, that are emitting CO2. CO2 emissions are distributed in a lot of different sources. Um, and um, the other thing is, is that we now have technology that can empower people to deal with the, the, that pollution in a way that they simply couldn't in 1970. And my favorite example, recent example, is in California when they were having their uh, an energy crisis, short energy crisis last September, they were facing blackouts and they simply they simply text texted um, residential customers. Now they'd never done this before, at least at this scale, um, and just said, "Look, we are facing shortages. Please conserve where you can." And within 15 minutes, they reduced demand by 2,000 megawatts, uh, which basically averted the blackouts. And just to put that in context, uh, California right now, their total grid capacity bat battery storage is 4,000 megawatts. So think about all the money that they have spent on those batteries and one text was able to replicate basically half of that um, for no cost. So it really shows the power of engaging, of democratizing environmentalism and engaging lots of people to do small things that add up to big results. That's a really interesting and cool example. I love it. Um, what other types of, you know, nimble innovators or people doing creative things like this can you highlight for us? Because, you know, I think these stories often get overlooked in the media and they often are hard to to show. So I'd love to, you know, hear more about a few others that excite you. Yeah, there's a lot of stories. It's funny because in my in my book, I tell lots of stories. Um, and the reason I tell so many stories is, is that oftentimes, especially for people who believe in, in markets like me, the critique that we get, and it's justifiable, which is, okay, that sounds good in theory, Todd. We get your, we get your market theory. Show us where it actually works in the real world. And so I'm very heavy on cool stories um, because I wanna show that this stuff does actually make a difference. And the second thing is, is that I want to inspire innovators. Um, because people are doing some amazingly clever things and I want more of that type of innovation. Um, I will give you another small example, but it just shows what can be achieved. Um, in Ghana, um, they have a very, uh, in the capital, they have a very haphazard uh, electrical system and there's lots of uh, blackouts uh, because the, the lines go down, a variety of other things. Um, and so the utility was having a difficult time determining where those blackouts were. So a group of students, um, I think at Cal Berkeley, um, came up with an app. And so people with cell phones, uh, the, what the app would do is if your phone was charging and had Wi-Fi and suddenly lost power and Wi-Fi and didn't move, right? So you didn't unplug it and leave, it would send a ping to the utility. And if the utility all of a sudden received several pings from the same area, it would know that there was a power outage there. Now, think about how simple that app is. And yet, 15 years ago, that is almost more sophisticated than we had in the United States. Before smart meters, the way most utilities would know if your power was out is if you called them. That's changed now. We have two-way communication. But think about everything we had to do with smart meters and smart meters don't just tell when there's power outage, I get that, but it is one of the functions. And yet with a simple app, they were able to tell the utility um, in Ghana, we, we, you know, we think we have a power outage here. So uh, that just, uh, it shows how ubiquitous the technology is, how the opportunities are to do really uh, amazing things at very low cost um, in a way that just didn't even exist 10 years ago. And I think we're only at the beginning of this kind of revolution. That is a very elegant solution, I must say. Kudos to those Berkeley students. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's, it, when I read about it, I just thought this is so clever because it's so simple and so powerful. <laughs> 
So you, your book also talks about the importance of making customers' decisions more environmentally friendly. So in the context specifically of carbon dioxide removal, how can we empower individuals to contribute when, you know, right now the cost of carbon removal credits are pretty high and, and there's some barriers to entry? Yeah. I think one of the greatest things about technology and information is that it brings people in who wouldn't otherwise be care about environment or climate concerns. So if, you know, if the strategy of climate policy is to get everybody to be concerned or support, you know, action on climate, we're in big trouble. <laughs> um, until recently, um, Gallup had climate change as the most divisive environmental or the most divisive issue, uh, even more divisive than abortion until last year. Um, so in that in, in that political climate, how do you engage people who think that climate change is either not a risk or a very low risk? And the way you do it is engaging them as a consumer. So for instance, I have in my uh, electrical panel, uh, something called a sense monitor, which just clips to the two wires into my house and then uses artificial intelligence to tell me uh, how much electricity I'm using. And it, deter it, it can detect the unique electrical signals of the appliances in my house and say, oh, you've just turned on your washer, you've just turned on your lights. And it helps me determine where I'm using electricity and how I can save. I don't have to think climate change is a crisis to see the value of that because it can help me save money. People are very attuned to gasoline uh, and the price of gasoline because they see it on every street corner. If you ask somebody what the price of a kilowatt hour is, they won't even know what a kilowatt hour is. <laughs> so how do you get people to be price sensitive in that environment? And, and especially during peak hours, when prices are the highest, but energy is also carbon intensive. And if you can simply tell people, look, if you, instead of washing your dishes or washing your clothes between four and 7 p.m., you do it later at night or earlier in the day, not only will you save money, but it'll be less carbon intensive. That sort of information is now available to everybody at their fingertips. And it's the kind of way to engage people who wouldn't otherwise act to reduce CO2 emissions. So last question for you, um, Todd, is about the groups that advocated for the new CDR funding in Washington. One of them is the Open Air Collective, which is um, a group of volunteers who are all online and advocate for carbon removal policies and projects. So when you think about networks and the and you know the public engagement and is this what you envision and is this the the strength we need to bring to continue the climate you know, the climate policies we need? I think it's hard because um, people have different levels of risk tolerance. Um, and so um, I have worked, you know, at in government agencies, I've dealt with advocacy organizations um, all the time. I work at a public policy think tank, we advocate. So um, I uh, especially appreciate the role uh, of the public that the public plays in making these decisions and encouraging them. But organizations whose sole purpose is, you know, to reduce CO2 emissions at any cost, I think that those kinds of political solutions are very fragile because when prices go up, um, people, you know, voters react uh, and they get upset. The way that we are going to see truly sustainable, and by sustainable, I mean, you know, in the truest sense of that word, which is that can be sustained over a long period of time, is innovation that um, can stand the test of time, stand the markets, and is available and attractive to people independent of their politics. It's a very hard, right, bar to meet. Uh, I understand that. Um, but I do worry about some, um, I think the groups that go out of their way to talk with all sides, people who agree and disagree with them and come up with more open-ended, more flexible and more innovative regulatory approaches, I think are gonna have the most success um, rather than those who say, we wanna spend money on this particular type of technology. Um, it's a hard balance and I, I certainly waffle, I certainly see the benefits as I've said of uh, Washington State 
of broadening its perspective and looking at carbon storage as opposed to just carbon reduction. I think those are good things, but I think how we do it makes a big difference in how successful we will be. Well, it seems like a perfect place to end. I so appreciate your time, Todd, and your perspective. We, um, for a long time on the show, had somebody from the uh, American Conservation Coalition, the ACC in DC, and he brought always a nice center-right perspective, and we've missed that. So I really appreciate your time and insights, and uh, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, I'm happy to be on. And, and look, there are a lot of folks on the center-right who, who care deeply about the environment. I speak to a lot of groups and uh, oftentimes in hushed tones, they will say, look, I, I am worried about environmental impacts, but I wanna do it in a way that fits my um, principles and my values. And I think there are a lot of opportunities to do that. So there are, you have uh, you know climate activists and other folks, I think uh, despair sometimes, but there are more allies, but I think we need to find a way to talk to each other. And that was one of the goals of my book is to show that there are innovative things that can do that can cross the ideological spectrum. And I'm, I'm really proud that the foreword of my book was actually written by somebody who is with the World Wildlife Fund. So these, these types of innovative approaches are really um, can bring people together in a way that I think is necessary to tackle the problems we face. Well, thanks so much, Todd. I couldn't agree with you more. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on.